Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I have to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me here, in particular, uh, of course, uh, Andrei Janszewski and uh, Jean-Luc uh, Tifo. They've been very kind. Um, it's always a pleasure to be, to be back in Cambridge. So this is a joint work with uh, Simone Zucker at the University of Verona. And uh, as you see, I'm going to talk about uh, aspects of uh, vortex dynamics that uh, are associated with a, a particular type of equation that uh, takes care of uh, quantum uh, defects. And uh, I'll do that uh, by focusing on aspects that are, uh, yes, uh, geometric and uh, uh, topological, but uh, uh, I'd like to point out the connections with the physics, because otherwise Andre would uh, stand up and leave immediately, and uh, to show you that maybe we have uh, some interesting information to uh, 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 decide about a particular evolution rather than another, and uh, that is uh, uh, related to the comment that uh, uh, Dewitt Sumner has made uh, in his talk. Okay, the summary. So uh, we have uh, uh, lots of uh, beautiful uh, surfaces uh, in uh, playing an important role in uh, biology, in chemistry, in uh, physics, of course. So the first uh, few slides is just to uh, keep track of some uh, aspects that uh, might help us to infer uh, physical properties. I will uh, particularly focus on the evolution of a Hopf link of quantum vortices. So I go back uh, for a moment to defects. So one uh, dimensional uh, systems uh, controlled under the GPE, this gross pitayevsky equation. I'll uh, then move to consider rive and twist helicity contributions. And then uh, I go from defects to uh, surfaces that are uh, bounded by these defects, so Zypher surfaces, and in particular the interpretation of this surface twist in terms of axial velocity flow for these filaments. Then I will uh, recall a result that I introduced some time ago on linear and angular momentum from signed area information, and I couple this information that is, uh, say, of a physical nature to the geometric information associated with the uh, uh, these uh, surfaces, and in particular the role of these minimal surfaces in this evolution. All right, so uh, this slide is a very, very uh, simple and of a general character. It's just uh, inferring uh, physical properties from shape. We n all know that uh, these are quite important. Uh, in particular, maybe the properties associated with formation of a certain type of uh, high curvature regions. Uh, sometimes uh, these uh, surfaces play the role of uh, uh, optimizing energy, like, like we have in uh, combustion. So it, it is quite important to think of this uh, surface as a surface um, that optimizes uh, a certain type of chemical reactions. Uh, but also the uh, fact that these surfaces may form very complex uh, networks or topologies, and uh, uh, again, uh, characterizing the uh, complex geometry or topology of these surfaces is also a quite interesting uh, piece of work. And we know that uh, these surfaces may minimize, uh, uh, say, tension, surface tension, like uh, uh, soap film uh, bubbles. Uh, so it's interesting to focus, maybe, to think of these uh, uh, soap films as, uh, as a good uh, example and to keep it in mind. Surfaces may arise in field theory. Uh, this is an example of an old paper by Batty and Sutcliffe on uh, high energy uh, modeling of, uh, of uh, reconnecting uh, um, um, structures. And uh, these surfaces are just a way to depict change of uh, topology, uh, but surfaces occur also in other contexts. Of course, we have uh, current uh, sheets, uh, uh, magnetic sheets as well. Uh, uh, this is just a picture from so satellite on a gigantic uh, flare 
from the sun, and uh, we see these uh, uh, formation of uh, uh, braided patterns of uh, plasma loops, and uh, uh, through reconnection and through interaction of these structures, we may have uh, uh, current sheets forming also in uh, plasma physics in confined environment like tokamaks, etc. These are quite important uh, aspects. Vincent, yes? Ask, uh, so, so, patterns on the bottom of the swimming pool on a summer, summer day, right? Do these uh, are, are these also fitting into your your theory? Uh, yes, yes. These are also kind. Of, well, these defects are optical defects, and this is a similar kind of. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't call it uh, a man. Uh, Robert Keane, I think, gave a name to these defects, but I think they are old as old as nature goes, and we're, n we're known to Newton, I think. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. caustics and the, in the uh, surfaces may help to detect uh, intensity of uh, field lines or field uh, uh, distribution, like uh, these are just isovorticity surfaces uh, for uh, two pieces of uh, uh, vortex uh, tubes are reconnecting. This is a typical bridging mechanism as uh, uh, visualized by this work of Hussein and Durarazmi. And then uh, we have also surfaces arising in, uh, uh, in uh, defect uh, uh, physics. These are just uh, two uh, vortex, uh, quantum vortices in, uh, under gross Pitayevsky, And these are the kind of surfaces that I will uh, uh, focus on. All right, so uh, a very brief uh, recap of what uh, is the background. We have, uh, uh, we think of vortex lines as a start, as a phase defect, and uh, the uh, function is a wave function that controls the, uh, the evolution. The wave function psi is a complex function and can be written in terms of uh, uh, density, rho, like mass density, uh, psi squared, and then uh, a phase uh, theta. Uh, the grad of the phase can be interpreted in terms of a velocity. A uh, velocity like a usual velocity, classical field. Uh, this is the equation I have in mind. This is gross pitayevsky equation. It is uh, one of these equations that uh, are nonlinear. This is the time derivative of this uh, psi function, and this is uh, uh, the uh, second derivative in space plus the nonlinearity here. So it's like the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. We take uh, in the numerics uh, this uh, assumption that uh, psi squared goes to 1, rho goes to 1 uh, as uh, uh, the position vector goes to infinity. And of course, we don't have uh, uh, later on in the numerics <coughs> infinity. We have uh, a box uh, that uh, uh, has to be. Uh, far away as far as possible from the evolution we want to uh, we want to study, and uh, I'll uh, show you that this is also a, a difficulty that has to be overcome. Uh, the size of the box, uh, of course, matters uh, compared to the phenomenon. What is interesting about Grospitayevsky is that uh, you go back to these two variables and the physical meaning. And uh, you can, uh, as an exercise uh, to students, you can ask them to decouple the real and imaginary part of this GPE. And uh, you find that uh, one uh, part uh, uh, leads you to the uh, continuity equation, the classical continuity equation. And the other part uh, is very much uh, similar to the Navier-Stokes equation, except, uh, well, you have the minus the uh, gradient of the pressure term, plus this term that plays the role of uh, uh, dissipation. It's not right uh, uh, exactly the same. It's called uh, quantum uh, stress, but uh, it plays the role similar to Navier-Stokes. In other, in other, uh, in other words, uh, you may think that this is not so important when the defects are well separated and distant one another. Uh, when, uh, however, the, these defects uh, are approaching one another and uh, eventually reconnect, uh, then this uh, becomes the relevant part. It's very little understood, so there is some work going on to understand in detail uh, the role of this part. These defects are really defects, are intersection of isophase surfaces, 
and uh, uh, if you if you think uh, of uh, a scale, uh, these defects would be on the scale of Armstrong's. We have a number of conserved quantities. Uh, uh, the system uh, is not integrable, so we don't have an infinite number of conserved quantities. But in this context, one important quantity is the Hamiltonian given by kinetic energy and uh, interaction energy. So how does P and tau appear? Pardon me? How? How do they appear, P and tau? Um, how do they appear, yeah, these quantities? Yeah. P, I remember P is a very strange function, and I... Right. I, I wouldn't know now to tell you. I can't remember. I have to check. These are very well known. And by the way, the fact that uh, these quantities uh, are constant uh, this fact is used to check also on the numerics. Uh, maybe um, Harder Salman uh, may comment on that later. I like the density squared. Right. And uh, tau is the Laplacian of square root of rho divided by square root of rho. Okay. Uh, helicity. Well, we heard from Dewey's talk. Helicity plays an important role. I have here the classical version of helicity is the velocity times the curl of velocity, which is vorticity. I'll uh, take a, a divergenceless condition. And a uh, well-known result in classical ideal fluid mechanics is that this quantity uh, should be constant. Uh, if I confine the vorticity to uh, localized structures like tubes, uh, then uh, we have uh, the result of Keith uh, that we can interpret uh, this uh, quantity that is constant in time in terms of uh, topology. And uh, in case uh, of uh, a link, we have, uh, of course, the Gauss linking number. And in case we have internal structure of uh, uh, field lines in these uh, structures, we have this uh, self-linking number, the Kalugariano white linking number, that can be farther decomposed in terms of global geometric quantities. Gauss linking number, of course, is uh, uh, an old uh, topological quantity. Uh, if we take, uh, instead of two separate curves, one uh, central curve and the neighboring curve, and construct uh, the ribbon, as we uh, shown, uh, then uh, uh, we have uh, the linking still well defined. We take the epsilon, the thickness of this ribbon going to 0, and we can prove, Caligurano proved, that this quantity is also topological invariant, but can be decomposed in terms of global geometric quantities, the rise and the total twist. Total twist can be further decomposed in the total torsion plus intrinsic twist, but there is no need to, do, uh, to go into that in my talk. Uh, twist is just a measure of uh, these uh, ribbon unit vector, the spanwise unit vector twisting about the central line. Right, I need the ribbon in order to compute twist. I want to compute right. I want to uh, uh, keep track of these quantities during uh, my uh, interaction of defects. So uh, this is the initial condition. I want to start with a Hopf link. Uh, in this case, uh, the surfaces are visualized by rho equal 0.1. I actually go to rho much, much uh, uh, lower. And the evolution starts t0, and it evolves. OK, so we have the two uh, rings uh, linked together. They move uh, at a certain point. Uh, they reconnect by anti-parallel reconnection at a certain time. So from the Hopf link, we go to one single folded uh, structure. Uh, we follow it up. And uh, there is a further reconnection here. From these uh, one single fold of structures, I get uh, the two separate uh, unlinked, uh, unknotted uh, filaments. And we can follow the process further to the further decay into three unknotted, unlinked uh, circles. I want to uh, follow up this in terms of uh, rise and twist and helicity. So the idea was, um, as anticipated by do it somehow to construct a, a Zypher surface and to detect the Zypher helicity on that. 
Now, the interesting thing is that this Zypher surface, we can pick any surface we like, or in other words, we can pick any theta we like. And uh, at a given theta, say theta star, I go all the way to the other defect. So if I uh, keep track of my theta star, a particular isophase uh, surface, I can construct on that a ribbon. And I can use this construction to work out twist. That avoids me to compute uh, torsion that involves uh, third order derivatives and the lots of numerical problems. So I can use this ribbon uh, to visualize uh, the structures and to uh, keep track of rise and twist. All right, so very quickly I show you this is helicity that is, remains uh, almost uh, zero. Uh, there are jumps here, little jumps, uh, and these jumps can be uh, made uh, even smaller if we enlarge the numerical box as far as possible. Uh, of course, enlarging the numerical domain costs time, so this is a difficulty. Uh, the three points here detect uh, the times of the reconnections. If we uh, compute right, yes? Uh, why, why isn't that that easy, yeah? Don't you have a discrete system? Yes. Why, why is the elasticity not an integer? Well, it stays almost zero. Okay. Almost zero. Yeah. It's very hard. These are, uh, you know, I can redo the numerical, the numerics here and uh, have these jumps uh, even smaller. Okay. I still have okay. little yeah. jumps from the numerical approximation. So I, I spend a, a few seconds to explain this. You have to think that all the times there are reconnections, there are kind of perturbations, uh, either Kelvin waves or other, that are propagating away from the reconnection site towards, uh, say, infinity. So towards the boundary of this numerical box, but the problem is that they come back. So they create some instability. If you enlarge the box, you can control better these systems. Uh, okay, so if we look at the rise, this is the total rise, and the total rise is computed using the formula that uh, DeWitt has uh, shown, uh, rise of each single individual plus uh, eventually, uh, or actually at the beginning, the linking, uh, the Gauss linking. Of course, we have uh, a change in topology as we go through these reconnection, and the physical information here is that rise keeps decreasing all the time. Remember, rise is a measure of, uh, uh, let's say, planarity, or the other way around, is a measure of three-dimensionality and folding. If the rise tends to zero, it means that we are going towards systems that tend to be planar. Twist also decreases. Uh, um, notice we have uh, 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 a minus sign here, and decreases consistently and it jumps quite uh, a lot uh, through this reconnection. And uh, this decreasing process is also quite interesting because uh, it uh, is related to uh, energy information, or energy transfer information. Here I picked uh, a surface, any surface we wish, and we can follow that. Uh, but uh, it would be interesting to focus on particular surfaces. So I'll pause a minute for, uh, uh, on these uh, surfaces to uh, uh, tell you that we can interpret a linear and angular momentum in terms uh, of a sine area of projected graphs. Uh, this is the momentum and this is the angular momentum, and we can rewrite these in terms of uh, vector quantities, of course, but these vector quantities are related to areas. Areas of what? Well, I have, uh, say, my link in space. I project the link on uh, a uh, plane, and I have to compute the area of this uh, planar projection. But because I get a graph from uh, a link in space, I have to come up with the definition of these areas. So I will uh, call this area as a signed area of the projected graph, and the assigned area along the i direction, say x, y, z, will contribute to the components of these quantities. I already picked a link. Uh, this is true for one single structure. It's also uh, true for a network of structures. So a link would do. I want to dual a little bit on this signed area to give you the idea and the uh, hint of the proof of this. So uh, I take my vortex uh, 
line uh, as an axis sky. Uh, vorticity is just a uniform quantity along the tangent. This is circulation, just the flux of this vorticity across the section of the filament. The linear momentum is defined in this way. And I rewrite omega as uh, in terms of tangent. This is dx dS, arc length s. And then uh, I extract uh, gamma from uh, this. So from a volume integral, I go to uh, a line integral. And then uh, I consider the integral of x dx, which contributes to 2 times the area, whatever is this area. So I can rewrite this as uh, gamma times uh, this particular area, where this area is just the area whose boundary is the length uh, of this axis. I have to take care of this area now, this uh, 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 calligraphic A. So I consider the projection, the component of the linear momentum along the i direction, and the area AI. Calligraphic is the area of the projected graph according to some, uh, some definition. So I define this area of the graph as the standard area or the contribution of uh, each region of the graph uh, in terms of standard area times this index. And this index is a topological quantity, is the in intersection, intersection number. Let's see how it works. So I have my graph projected from uh, uh, the space curve. And uh, I identify the region, R1, R2, R3. I then consider the intersection number that I get from picking any point in this region uh, along the radial direction outwardly. Uh, and I consider the right-hand uh, uh, frame with the t unit tangent along this oriented graph. And then uh, I assign a plus 1 or minus 1 according to sign convention. So in this case, I hit uh, this uh, curve only once here. And according to my reference frame, I have a plus 1. This plus 1 is this uh, uh, graphic uh, i uh, attached to this r1 region. I do the same for the second region. I intersect only one point here. And uh, this would be 1. Mind you, I can take a point here and go all the way through another direction. The number won't be affected, is always the same number. All right, plus 1, I go for the third region here. I go into this direction. I intersect two points. And it happens from the graph I took that uh, they are both uh, contributing to plus 1. So it's uh, plus 2. Remember, I can go any direction I want. And no matter which direction I pick, I will end up with the same algebraic quantity. So these are the weights I associate to the area. So if the area is small, but the weight is uh, uh, large, that uh, uh, contributes to the momentum uh, differently than if the area is small and the index is small. If the index comes to be 0, like a hot link uh, projected uh, with opposite uh, orientation, then the internal uh, region would have an index 0. That means it won't uh, contribute to the linear momentum. If we shoot the two rings one against the other, it is intuitive to think that the linear momentum is 0. And indeed, <laughs> the uh, area information would help to establish that. OK, so we have this uh, curly A now associated to the uh, diagram. And we can establish this connection between uh, the, uh, the, the link uh, in space uh, and its interpretation in terms of areas, projected areas, to the momenta. Is it still true if you shoot the vortex rings at each other with an uh, impact parameter that's not 0, so it's not on the axis? OK, very well. I showed uh, in, a, in another talk, actually, here uh, a few years ago. Um, there is a beautiful experiment by Lim on, uh, let, me, let, me, let me just uh, comment on that first, and then I come to your question. Uh, uh, that uh, you have uh, 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 two vortex rings exactly coaxially, and the result of that is that there are reconnections that trigger uh, lots of sister rings uh, uh, inheriting the blue and the red from the, uh, from the original uh, filaments. And uh, you can see from uh, the movie that they go oppositely 
and you can do these uh, analyses and you can work out the plus and minuses that are coming out from the system. They of course have to balance out because the uh, linear momentum of the whole system is zero. So to get to your point, uh, of course, if you have uh, a NOF, uh, uh, a, an unsymmetric uh, collision, then you have areas of plus and minus. The linear momentum will still be zero, but the angular momentum will not be zero. Oh, of course, of course. You have that too. You have that too from this analysis. You have, uh, you have uh, the, lin the angular momentum uh, with, you can identify an axis of rotation. And so you have a, what uh, we may call an aerial moment contribution. Okay, so now, uh, yes, you say, okay, pick, uh, pick your isophase surface you wish, and you follow it. Now, this is uh, one of the good uh, news uh, for this talk, because this is a really work in progress. I want to switch to the movie, so I will show you the movie of the evolution of this surface, but which surface we pick? We, s we pick a surface that has minimal area. So of the many isophase surfaces we have, we look for the minimal area surface. So this is the evolution. Uh, OK, at the beginning, uh, nothing particularly interesting, except the fact that you see the role of the twist of this surface. Remember, you are always seeing a minimal surface evolution. This, uh, this surface, at a certain point, uh, gets stretched. And the stretching will uh, in use a reconnection a bit lower here. You will see it in a moment. OK, it will appear here. The vortices are locally anti-parallel. So a first reconnection takes place now here. It will, uh, you see there is a kind of stretching of this surface. And this is due to the fact that this region has high curvature. And the curvature for vortex dynamics means, uh, means uh, high impulse. And then a second reconnection takes place here. And you can see really the, the evidence of this uh, stretching acting on the structure. And then again, uh, that we have a third reconnection taking place uh, uh, roughly here. It's barely visible. But uh, it is, again, uh, due to this uh, curved surface. So I think the surface plays a good role to understand the physics. Uh, I told you we look at the minimal area surfaces. And so I want to go back to my slides. Well, first of all, a comment on reconnection. Uh, we have anti-parallel reconnection regions here. And these reconnections uh, are uh, more or less the same at various uh, instances, like so. And this is uh, in agreement, in a sense, with the, the talk of Dewitt Sumner's. Uh, we have uh, the interpretation of uh, the surface twist in terms of velocity, I don't want to dwell too much on this. I just like to convey the idea that, uh, of course, given a surface, because of uh, this definition, the velocity, the fluid velocity, so to speak, uh, should be thought of as the normal to the surface. If uh, a defect uh, is identified by a, a fan of these uh, surfaces, that leads you to have, uh, a, say, a circulatory uh, uh, velocity around the axis of, these, uh, of this defect. This uh, you can estimate from classical uh, fluid dynamics. Uh, for, for example, in this case, could be gamma over uh, 2 pi r, r being the distance from the straight uh, vortex. If uh, you have uh, a twisted uh, surface in the fan of twisted surfaces, then you can associate twist uh, uh, in terms of axial flow along uh, the, uh, the filament axis. So this is also quite interesting. Uh, to have a physical effect from uh, the induced twisted uh, surface. But uh, this is the main result. The main result is that we compute uh, uh, the evolution of this uh, minimal area versus time. 
And uh, we saw that uh, for the uh, evolution I showed you, this minimal area keeps decreasing all the time. I know what you're saying. You say, well, here is actually not quite decreasing, is uh, coming up again. We have the three reconnections taking place here. And indeed, uh, the blue curve is just enlarging the numerical box. Enlarging the numerical box size means that uh, you uh, can do a bit better on this uh, region. We are still have problems here, and we believe, uh, we are pretty confident, that this uh, actually increase in area is purely numerical. It's a numerical problem that we want to sort out by uh, having more computational power in order to extend further the effects of the box size. We have a little effects in the box size at the beginning, not visible, because you have to uh, just start up the initial condition. It takes time, the initial condition, to get to the boundary of this box and to revert back the information. And then at the end here, uh, sorry, here, you have the problem that uh, your structures are well separated, and uh, so they move uh, a bit towards, uh, say, the numerical box. So you have to enlarge the numerical box in order to keep the distance from the defects uh, the same as the beginning. All right, so we investigated the problem for uh, more complex structures, and uh, this is, as I said, ongoing work. And uh, the problem is, uh, as DeWitt said, uh, that we are looking for a criterion, at least in this context, where we can uh, uh, trust, uh, let's say, the GPE evolution, a criterion that justifies uh, uh, this topological decay. Uh, the topological decay can be detected uh, by some uh, polynomials, as I did uh, with Xin Liu recently, uh, but this is not enough. You want to relate uh, the topological decay uh, with, uh, with energy or some information related to energy, in this case, linear momentum. Uh, we We'd like to have a criterion to select uh, which uh, evolution nature prefers. So we tested, uh, well, this is just a, a little information about the phase. Uh, theta uh, is the phase uh, uh, angle uh, of the minimal surface uh, as it evolves. This is time, so we take a uh, gradient uh, of uh, theta in space and time, and we can uh, uh, infer something about the evolution. But uh, this is uh, the next step. The next step is the trefoil. We went to the trefoil. Remember the experiment in the classical, uh, in the class in water done by Kleckner and Irvine. You see a decay process from a trefoil to the hop link to the unlink folded and then to the two separate links. We can see the same thing here. We do see exactly the same process as. Uh, uh, by Kleckner and Irvine. We start with the trifle knot. Again, we have the problem that as uh, the knot as the knot evolves, uh, then uh, we have uh, uh, to take care of the boundary uh, reflection of these perturbations. We went on to test uh, other knot types of increasing complexity, and we could follow the same path. In other words, starting from a highly complex knot, uh, the knot decays following the same uh, cascade process uh, we saw before, uh, but the minimal area keeps decreasing all the time. So this is my final slide. Uh, so we have a trifoil knot here. Uh, if we start uh, higher up in complexity, say the Q9, the Q9, the minimal area keeps decreasing. The Q9 has, goes through a number of reconnections. And by two reconnections, uh, we go to the Q7. The Q7 decays farther through links and then knots to the Q5. The Q5 decreases farther to the Q3. And the Q3 decays farther to the hot link, et cetera, et cetera. So all this pattern is confirmed under GPE. But what is uh, also very nice is that we can track uh, this evolution or the whole cascade in terms of diminishing minimal surface. So this is my, my end uh, message. This is work in preparation. Thank you very much for your attention. So Rizzo, in this uh, cascade here, you see only two comma and torus knots and links. You don't see any of the other possibilities? No, we see. Huh, so problem is uh, uh, we would uh, see, I, I suspect we will see all the cascade stages. Problem in the simulation is that uh, we have to <laughs> 
Imagine that uh, you configure the initial configuration, the initial data, and you want a, a torus knot that is not exactly symmetric, as is given by standard equations. Because if it is symmetric, then reconnections take place all at the same time. And you cannot detect all these stages. So you have to, how to say, perturb a little bit the mathematics, mm. the initial condition, in order to see all the. Is the work we've done with the hot link? The hot link was uh, set up uh, in order to see one reconnection at a time. Because if you start with exact uh, uh, symmetric uh, uh, configuration, you don't see that happening. Now we can follow this cascade in the trefoil knot and get so to. To uh, perturb a little bit the trefoil knot and let it evolve. And uh, as a start, we just checked uh, first on the area information on more complex systems. So, what you would do from the 2 9, from the 2 9 would be a number of reconnections, maybe four, maybe all of them together. So, you don't want that to, uh, to take place. Okay, so I, I, I guess I have two questions. Um, first is, does mod side squared go to zero and the reconnection? Say it again. Does mod side squared go to zero on the reconnection? I, uh, what do you mean? You're, you're doing, uh, right, you're doing gross PTSD, right? Right. And gross PTSD involves side. Right. And the question is, and it's a complex number. So this is the modulus of this complex number oh, right. go okay. to zero. Yes. Yes, they do. So how do you continue the velocity? The velocity is a gradient of a fu of, of function, I mean, it's of an angle that's not defined. Uh, sure. You do not uh, compute the velocity on the on, of course, on the defect. That's the singularity. But how do you take the next time step? <laughs> uh, I, uh, Simone Zucker might help you on this. I, I, I exactly don't know. <laughs> well, the other question is, uh, what about uh, periodic boundary conditions? Right. So uh, again, uh, the, uh, so sure, I am I'm aware of those. Uh, the technical information is in the paper, in the Physical Review E paper of this year. Uh, I will give you all the information through the paper. Is uh, uh, is a mirroring uh, eightfold uh, the uh, original box, and that uh, is the only little thing I remember. But I am not so good at telling you details of the of the. Sorry for this. Uh, Renzo, yes. you, um, you give a very convincing proof of what is actually, I think, quite well known that the um, momentum of a oral vortex or a system of linked vortices is. Uh, is equal to the signed area. Right. Um, so I don't see what's special. I mean, it doesn't depend on which area you choose, which surface. Exactly. So why does the minimal area surface be of any particular significance? Uh, perhaps uh, because, uh, um, well, uh, of course, uh, w we don't know. We pick the minimal area because we believe it might convey some information on minimal <coughs> energy. Uh, not not in terms of the of the momentum interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the momentum interpretation is irrelevant. Which area you pick? Okay. So, do experiments in whatever system confirm this particular time scales that you uh, obtain numerical? I I cannot comment uh, right now on that. Uh, the, the 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 time scale of reconnection has been checked by several authors, and so we are consistent with the results of others. Uh, uh, maybe again, uh, uh, Brache has done uh, work on that. Uh, uh, Haider has done work on this. Uh, the time scale is pretty, of the single reconnection is, is consistent, yes, of course. But you don't know for the cascade. But, but this is not known, it is new, so. Okay, so thanks, Peter, again. Okay, thank you.